Well, thank you so much, Karen, and also to our amazing organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and we have some amazing guests on stage with us as well. So I think the uh, topic we're going to cover uh, is going to be about carbon markets. Uh, we also want to touch on important topics in energy, uh, in the development of green finance in the Greater Bay Area, and also uh, some thoughts about the future. What kind of solutions can we create with technology actually to help us rescue our planet from imminent collapse and planetary disaster? So we'll start off with short introductions from our amazing uh, panelists, uh, and then I'll sort of help us with some moderation questions and also uh, expand on some of these key topics. So maybe we can start with Julian. If you say a few words about yourself, Cynthia, yeah, then I'll sort of finish. Thank you, Max. Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you. Uh, to the Myanmar organization. So my name is Julian Martin. I'm a French national, but I've been in Asia for the last 18 years, uh, between Shanghai and Hong Kong. Um, I'm uh, very passionate about finance and passionate about uh, traditional finance uh, linking into new finance and going especially into climate finance. Um, I've, uh, I've been working very, very much on the opening of Chinese uh, capital markets, first in the bank and then uh, in a, in a very well-known exchange, very close to Hong Kong. Um, and, and after that, basically, uh, moving into climate finance is a natural move to me. Um, I feel like there's a, there's a huge need in the market for creation of more tools uh, for facilitating the transition, uh, whether it's around carbon or any other topics that we are going to be talking about today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Max. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm the CEO of Citizenship International which is a company that specializes in hydrogen fuel cell technologies. Uh, my background, I was in investment uh, for over 10 years, and then got this great opportunity to start explore uh, technologies in the new energy area, uh, hence uh, you know, where I am today um, in the uh, hydrogen field. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of the International New Energy Alliance, it is the alliance that uh, tried to create an ecosystem uh, for the new energy sector, uh, including finance, technology, industry. Uh, so very glad to be here today to share our views and uh, uh, to dis discuss the future of sustainability. Thank you so much, Cynthia and Julian. So for the audience, my name is Max Song. I'm the founder and CEO of Carbon Base, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, share with you a little bit of, of what we're doing as well. So we are in the uh, middle stages of creating market infrastructure for the carbon markets here in Asia. And for those of you guys in the audience who are curious about carbon markets, we'll expand in more detail. But many people have probably heard about carbon credits. So just show of hands if you've ever heard the word carbon credit before in your work or in your field. It has, I see, maybe 80, 90% representation. Now, one of the key questions that people uh, like to ask is where do these carbon credits come from? What is the origin of the carbon credits? And how do we actually make these carbon credits? How do we validate them? How do we ensure that they are indeed credible instruments? And what exactly are their roles in actually driving the kind of solution we're you know, in desperate need of? So that's something that we'll sort of begin our panel with. Uh, in my own previous work, I used to uh, do investments for several multi uh, single family offices here in Hong Kong. And before that, I was a data scientist uh, in Silicon Valley. I've also been uh, having the honor to be a board member of one of the virtual banks in Hong Kong. So in dealing with HMA, dealing with licensed uh, financial institutions, and also understanding how do you create a bridge between institutional capital and finance with the emerging green tech sector. So without further ado, we'll sort of dive into the first topic. Um, Julian, in your uh, previous career, um, you were instrumental in building both market infrastructure between Hong Kong Exchange and also uh, China, creating the Bond Connect, and then to lead innovation in digital assets and then applying those innovation tools to Carmen. Can you share a bit about lessons you learned from that experience and also what you think are necessary technological tools required to innovate the carbon space? So, so if you look at the, at the carbon markets as they've been built, uh, you've got a, a range of different infrastructure and the whole value chain stems from registries, eventually moving into, obviously, project managers, investors, brokers, 
And there's, there's a group of, of you, know, um, um, you know, IT technology vendors that are actually trying to improve process, uh, making uh, the you know, like verification, measurements, reporting easier. Um, all in all, uh, when I looked at this market a few years ago, uh, I felt like there was a lot of uh, inefficiency in the market. And the efficiency is, also, is, is in so far important that uh, we need this overall finance system to exist, not in the range that we are now. We need, we need this whole ecosystem to grow maybe 100 times, if not 200 times, to actually deal with the climate change issues that we are facing and that the next generation are going to be facing even more. So, you know, looking at the whole ecosystem, really, registries are a very important part, and that's why, you know, I like, I like your ideas of, uh, of, you know, building more and more infrastructure. The eventual uh, place where I felt there was also a lot of uh, interaction needed was around distribution and, and basically involvement of the end investor uh, of the of the reward of the of the carbon credits in order to properly price the cost of the usage of Mother Earth, which we haven't been doing for the last 200 years. We've been developing without even looking at the cost of the environment, and now it's time we actually reprice a lot of the industries that we have with this cost in place. And if we do that, suddenly we're going to have a very different ecosystem and a very different economy. It's not going to be immediate but we can't wait too much. So I think from my experience, uh, we, need, we, need, we need monetary tools, we need financing mechanism, we need financial engineering, and obviously we need innovation in systems, in technology, we need countries and states that are very willing to help us to be the reception of all of these new projects. We need very courageous project managers that are going to um, go into all the new technologies, you know, like hydrogen or others, uh, that we are that we are looking at, and this whole ecosystem needs to be built back, and it needs to be built back with one very strong new uh, dimension or, or risk management tool, which is this environment of this climate change, you know, or whatever biodiversity. All of these elements needs to be embedded into everything we do, and if suddenly we start doing this again, our entire ecosystem is going to be changed. Thank you so much. And transitioning to Cynthia and sort of talking about the uh, types of technology that are necessary. You know, when people talk about carbon, the mirror side of carbon, the same uh, coin on the other face is energy, right? How do we manage our energy? How do we create new types of energy that actually allow us to continue our civilization without actually sacrificing uh, the nice things we have, you know, we currently enjoy without also destroying the planet? Um, can you share a bit about the work that Samsung has been doing? Uh, about the growth and evolution of the hydrogen markets in particular, and also what you see as kind of something that we can look forward to in the next uh, few years. Sure, so um, I'll answer the questions one by one. The first one is what we do. Um, so Sense Energy, we, um, you know, we specialize in uh, fuel cell technology, and also we provide a uh, solution um, package uh, for the end users. Uh, if I put that into perspective, uh, for example, there, there are mainly two types of scenarios uh, that you can see the application of this technology. One is in the transportation area. Uh, I, I think if people have heard about carbon, you might have as well heard about hydrogen vehicles, hydrogen buses, hydrogen uh, heavy duty trucks. And uh, I'm also glad to uh, tell you that next time if you're around in Shanghai, in, in Lingang district, um, you, know, you can ride on a hydrogen tram. Uh, it's already commercialized. And the other type of application is stationary cell, which is a power generation. Um, so you can imagine in the future, the lighting and energy in this hall, uh, in this hall will be uh, provided by um, hydrogen or new energy sources. And, and the second question in terms of you know where does the hydrogen technology is and uh, uh, together with the third question about where the future will be. Um, so Max mentioned about a very important element, which is energy. Uh, a lot of time people would compare hydrogen with you know EV vehicles, uh, but the key element here is energy. Because hydrogen is regarded as a uh, you know, source of energy by most of the countries worldwide now. 
So it's not just simply a tool uh, to be used in vehicles. Uh, it's been regarded as a source of energy. Um, and then second is um, currently the space and also the speed uh, of the development in hydrogen is much more advanced uh, than most of the people think in the market. Um, so for example, uh, in, in China, uh, if we're talking about the upper stream, hydrogen production and the transportation of the hydrogen, uh, you probably have heard about uh, uh, the, the western hydrogen will be transported to the east part of China. Because the west of China is rich in solar and wind. And uh, a lot of the SOEs have now invested heavily in green hydrogen production. And then what the west hydrogen will be transferred to the east, what that means is that they are building a pipeline which will transport the hydrogen from the east to, uh, sorry, to, from the west to the east to use. And if we are, you know, uh, zoom out globally, uh, if we look into Europe, so Italy is going to import green hydrogen from north part of Africa. So if we just take you know, the hydrogen production example that I just highlighted, um, you can already sense it's no longer a small scale pilot program or it's no longer a small scale uh, within a city or province. Uh, it's now actually being cross country uh, technology used. So then if we use that as a standpoint to look forward for three or five years, uh, we can see a widely used uh, of hydrogen technology globally, uh, thanks to two things. The first one is the cost. So the cost along the upstream, middle stream, and downstream uh, have come down and will keep going down uh, in the next few years, which will enable the use of the hydrogen and its you know, related technologies. And the, the second is the advance of technology development. And thanks to our scientists globally, people are working on um, you know, storage of hydrogen and also vehicles and also um, you know, like, um, the power generation by using hydrogen. So, um, so in conclusion, we are very, uh, I think the future of uh, uh, vast use of hydrogen is very promising. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So I think something that didn't really uh, I understand until I talk a lot to Cynthia is that hydrogen compared to solar or wind is not only a means of uh, creating energy, really it's a means of transporting the green energy that we can create, right? Being able to move it from places where there is a lot of wind and solar to places where there's a lot of human consumption. So I think the example of the East-West uh, transition is a really, really strong example. Uh, Building on the exciting opening ceremony that we had earlier today, just show of hands, how many of you guys were in the audience for the uh, very beginning opening session? Some of you guys. So as a brief recap, for you guys who haven't had a chance to see this yet, hope you guys catch the replay, there was this amazing kind of dialogue and panel between the current governor of the AIIB, the Asian Structure Investment Bank, uh, the advisor to the Chinese uh, banking regulator, uh, Kishore Mombani, who was the former uh, sort of president of the UN Security Council, the big author on Asia rising as a general geopolitical security concept, and Joe Tsai, uh, the vice chairman of Alibaba. And their dialogue revolved around the leadership opportunities that Asia has specifically in global challenges. And I think climate change probably is one of the most key places where, despite all of the things you read about in the Western press, China, you know, India, Southeast Asia have actually done great things to advance the right, state technology, investments, and also financial architecture. So can you guys share a bit of your perspective? Where do you think the opportunities of Asia look like? Right? Why is it both imperative, but also uh, maybe uh, strategic for Asia to invest in sustainability? Uh, and how does that touch the work that you're doing personally? So, so I'll talk, I'll start, I think, uh, the first, the first thing obviously is the uh, overall footprint, right? So, uh, if you look at the carbon footprint of the world, Asia is uh, roughly half of the carbon footprint of the world, and, uh, and unfortunately growing. Um, so, it means the issue is here, um, or at least 
the biggest part of the issue is here. Um, when you look at technology, um, and the technology, whether it's nature-based solution or whether it's tech-based solution, most of the solution is actually here as well. Um, so, you know, in terms of project management, in terms of government aligned approach, you know, especially with, with the strength of China behind Asia to some extent, the, you know, the alignment of, of industries and the, the alignment of supply chain in, in those, all those new tech-based solutions is going to be an absolutely immense here in Asia compared to the rest of the world. And obviously the Greater Bay Area is probably one of the best use cases uh, because on one side you have, you know, again, the footprint and the solution, the issue and the solution here. So what's funny is at the end of the day there's not enough infrastructure to deal with this, right? We, especially in terms of financial infrastructure, I'm, I'm coming back to my financial background because I think that's, that's where, you know, at the end of the day, we need funds to invest in these technologies. We need, uh, we need some, you know, mechanism to allow more participation, not just from funds, but also from corporates, from uh, institutionals, from investors. Um, and, and we need new policies. And, 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 you know, we can see all around Asia, there's been new policies in stock exchanges, in venture funds, in PE. For, for them to actually request the portfolio companies uh, or the listed companies to improve their overall reporting. That is going to create even more demand for solution, right? So, you know, again, for me, a lot of the issue is here, a lot of the solution is here, a lot of the destination for the project is going to be here as well. And there require, we require more infrastructure in Asia, and especially in Greater China, in order to deal with these issues. I think it's absolutely critical. And from here, we can help serve the rest of the world with a very different mindset. I mean, I'm European, I can see the way Europeans are, doing, are dealing with this whole climate approach right now. It's very frugal, right? They're, they're, in, the, they're, they're in the development uh, cycle, which is very different from Asia. Asia is all about innovation, Asia is all about changes, and, and, and things can move much faster here than they would move out of Europe, and, and I think some of the North American friends still haven't really understood there is a problem. So again, I think the solution is here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I cannot agree more uh, about Trey's points, and I just want you to add uh, from the industry point of view, uh, I think you know Asia uh, mainly provide like three perspectives into the global development. Uh, the first one is definitely innovation and technology. So, so speaking in the hydrogen space, uh, I think a lot of us know that Japan, uh, you know, is also very famous for the hydrogen technology. And now uh, we have China is rising in terms of uh, the technology uh, across the value chain. And as well as I also want to point, uh, point out Malaysia. So Malaysia is uh, one of the areas that, uh, Asian countries that uh, following uh, Japan and China started uh, the pilot program in hydrogen. Um, because they, uh, they bought three hydrogen vehicles, buses, in uh, 2019. And then they did the pilot program for uh, three years, three to four years. And they're very happy about it. So they came back um, to China and also went to Japan, had another round of exploring. And now they have the aim to build a hydrogen hub uh, in the Southeast uh, uh, Asia area. So I think the first one is technology. And then the second is the uh, application or the usage of technology. Uh, this is very important because if we only have technology alone, uh, it will, without any, um, you know, the vast uh, or the wide application of the technology, the limitation, uh, you know, is very obvious. I think Asia uh, is uh, the region and area that is very um, brave to try uh, new energy. Uh, you know, it's across the government and industry. Um, all the parties, uh, once they have the goal, and then they will be eager to push for it and test out new technology. Uh, so, so I think um, you know Asia is very good at providing that kind of uh, environment for new energy, such as such as hydrogen. And the third area is definitely the cost. Uh, I think globally, uh, Asia always played the role um, of 
you know, making the best use of the technology possible, i.e. making the cost down. Um, so, so I think that's the three main contributions in the technology. And if we link that to the other side um, of the Earth, which is Europe, um, I, I, I believe that there's a lot of interactions uh, because of those three things. So for example, if there's new technology in Europe in the hydrogen area, then Asia would be a very good ground for them to test out uh, because the, you know, the, the region is uh, very welcome those technologies and there's incentives, there's uh, um, subsidies. Uh, so, so I think it's created a, a very good ecosystem. Um, but, but what about you, Max? What do you think about you know the the question you asked us. Sure. Um, so thank you guys both for your amazing answers. Uh, and this panel is unusual because um, we, it's, a, it's a group moderation, so I'll uh, take a chance to answer this as well. For me, if you look at how the carbon markets in the world look like today, uh, you notice something really interesting. In the voluntary carbon markets internationally, there are four main entities known as carbon registries that represent 99% of the carbon credits that are issued. Two in particular are the dominant players. One represents about 80 plus percent, the other one about 10 percent. The two small ones are less than a few percentage points. If you look at the annual reports of these registries, you find that 70 percent of the projects that actually draw down carbon, that are actually recipients of the accreditation process, originate in Asia. So not only is Asia the source of the emissions, Asia today actually is already at the forefront of the reduction and mitigation stack as well. Unfortunately, the standard setters, the people who actually have the ability, the permission to create the standards, currently sit in Switzerland and in the United States. And they've been phenomenal pioneers in actually the very fact that we can actually create and assign value to climate mitigation. That is a powerful economic innovation. Unfortunately, the user experience of many Asian project developers have been lacking. It takes a long time to actually hear responses back from the registries and the technological underpinnings of the registries are still very antiquated. You know, it's kind of web 0.5 days. So what would we look like in the future? I think that there's an opportunity for Asia to be at the, at the starting line of a new set of standards that actually determine how value gets assigned to environmental attributes. Not only to carbon credits, but also to biodiversity credits, to, you know, um, uh, like mangrove and blue ocean and ocean preservation credits, and even to new energy vehicle credits. The more miles and kilometers you drive in these, you know, non, you know, gasoline cars, actually should urge you some sort of economic recognition as well. So we have the ability in Asia to start thinking about the reassignment of value, and that reassignment of value is going to, going to lead to economic behavioral change and optimization by using the engine of capitalism actually to drive more resources to climate innovation around the world. So in our last you know, eight minutes or so, I want to take uh, a sort of short rapid fire questions uh, so we can each sort of say a few words. You know, don't have to have too long answers. Um, and, uh, and then we'll sort of conclude on one inspiring message that uh, each one of us wants to have for the audience and also for future viewers of the, uh, the video as well. Um, so, uh, one or short word answers. Okay. Uh, meat or vegetarian diet? Meat. Meat. Um, carbon removal or carbon uh, avoidance? Carbon removal. Same. <laughs> um, living frugally to avoid uh, sort of mitigation and uh, emissions, or creating new technology and energy resources uh, to achieve the same outcome? Both. A mix of both. Uh, Asia, Europe, US, which one do you think will see the most exciting climate stuff in the next five years? I think all of those, all of those uh, regions. Yeah, in different areas. I actually think it's going to be Asia. Not only because Asia is technically a little bit late, but also because Asia moves much faster when, when it gets its mind to it. And uh, I think the way we're going to be structuring 
all these new activities are going to make Asia move much faster, and especially Asian capital move much faster. Um, so um, the last part, you guys can choose how you answer and what you want to emphasize. But I would love to have you leave our audience here with either an idea um, or a particular vision or a philosophy that you found very powerful in doing the climate, uh, climate crisis or the climate innovation. So, so I think I think we we talked about it earlier. Um, there's been a lot of different events in our history, in our recent histories, that have tilted the uh, you know. The, the equation and, and, and it's changed a lot of our monetary system, right? So, you know, we, we talked about the Suez Canal event that basically kind of removed the pound from the equation and, and started the, uh, uh, the push of the dollar. Uh, and then, obviously, the entire petrodollar system, which is now the system that we live on, which has been building up over the last, last you know, at least from the financial infrastructure point of view has been you know built over the last sixty to seven years and which we all entrenched in, right? So I I mean I spent fifteen years of my career trying to I mean pushing R and B and pushing Chinese economy and making more and more investors go into China, pushing Chinese debt so that there's more and more bilateral relationship between states and China so that you know there's a, a lot more balanced view on uh, on the overall economic development and uh, and where currency is so important. So I actually think we need a new currency to eventually change the ecosystem that we operate in. Uh, the dollar is too linked to the petrol, right? So whether it's the green RMB, whether it's a mix of uh, multiple currency that is going to be helping us deal with biodiversity loss and climate change. Uh, whether that will come from the you know Web three and uh, or I don't want to say crypto because it's always a you know a tough a tough word to use here, but like digital asset world, uh, I I actually believe that something uh, absolutely huge is going to come in front of us very soon, and that's going to be an entire tilt in our uh, in our financial ecosystem, and and that's going to you know put a lot of our uh, certainties back to another level. Um, for, for me, I, uh, you know, I, will, I would like to leave um, two messages. So the first one is, um, you know, given all the geopolitical tensions in different areas, uh, I, I believe a sustainability, um, um, you know, geo carbon or reducing the carbon emission is one of the few areas that can bring different countries together, can bring like China, Europe, and US together to work on, because we're all fighting for it. And so, so that's the first message. So you know, it's um, the area to be uh, in the next few years. Second is second message is that um, uh, I believe that we're experiencing a very exciting time. Uh, we're very lucky to be able to have uh, you know, different source of energy or combination energy that can pick and choose uh, from. Uh, it's very different from a uh, few years ago when we first started the, uh, you know, this journey. And, and also it's very exciting to see how different countries are dealing with you know, the carbon credit. Uh, I just want to share one uh, example is that we always believe like forest is, um, you know, one a big source of uh, carbon credits. Um, you know, I, I'm not in this field, so I will leave for you to comment. Uh, you know, in China, but uh, we just recently heard that in New Zealand, uh, the government will actually buy the carbon credit from the companies or uh, institutions who own the forest, and then the, company, the government will treat those on their uh, carbon credit exchange. Um, so everything is very fascinating, fascinating and uh, um, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's an era good to be in. Thank you. Um, I'll tell a short story and then I think that's the end of our time here. So I just came back to the U.S. Uh, and I was very lucky to attend the uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Uh, so Warren Buffett's kind of a, a global town hall. And what I found amazing about the way that they built this organization is that they emphasized a lot of concentration of value, uh, oh, sorry, concentration of attention on the shareholders, the people who hold shares of this company. And the advantage of Berkshire Hathaway in doing this 
was that they were able to break the quarterly earning reporting trap and just focus on creating value for their people. Now, you know, as much as the amazing financial success of Berkshire has been recognized, uh, they're still in the early days of evolution for climate. So while I was there, a lot of the proposals at the end of the AGM was around sustainability. And unfortunately this year, many of them didn't pass. But what I can see is the way that we decide what's important. And so much, so, so many times in business, everyone sort of used the business as usual argument as actually a defense around not caring for the climate. Because my shareholders, my investors, my customers don't care. And as well, that's a reason for me not to do something. And I think that we need to completely lean into and change that entire response. It is not acceptable anymore just to say that because other people don't care about this, that it's not up to you. In fact, the companies and investors today can cultivate investors and shareholders who believe in climate change and who support the company's long-term decision. So I really think that there's this powerful cultural engineering possible actually in appointing and choosing who you want to be your stakeholders and allowing your stakeholders to be with you on the journey and not being the obstacles to your journey. So uh, I think Beyond has been an amazing platform for us to change ideas. It also meets new friends. I really encourage everyone in the audience to come and say hi to our amazing panelists afterwards. Uh, and also hopefully this leads to more conversation in your own work of life, your business practice, your NGO leadership, or even just your personal lifestyle, how you actually incorporate business and sustainability, creating a positive alignment between purpose, planet, and profit. So thank you guys very much for your attention. A round of applause for our amazing panelists.